Okay, let's look at census methods. Now we know how to identify the butterflies, we know how to set up our transects, hopefully we have them set up with uh, pin flags and uh, easy to follow uh, tracks. So there are three types of uh, census. Uh, we'll have a look at presence, absence, a modified peak count, and then the big one, the most important one, distance sampling. So presence, absence. Well, you can observe an adult butterfly. Uh, you can observe a larva uh, before the flight, maybe in March or even April. Or later on, you could observe uh, eggs on the undersides of the, uh, the leaves. If you can find 10 or more eggs, they're usually empty. I think, uh, the first video showed you what they look like. And uh, you find them by gently pushing the uh, leaves to one side until you can see the undersurfaces, look for the eggs, and then gently push, put the leaves back again. So any of these, a larva, uh, 10 or more eggs, and uh, an adult, any of those established presence, and that's what you need. Record that it was present and why. I mean, actually, it's very rare for anything else to lay eggs like that. So probably if you saw just one or two eggs, the uh, Fender's blue is present, so you need to really uh, look harder and see if you can't find enough to satisfy the criterion here. Uh, modified peak count. So this is to do this, you count all the males. So it's usually for a small site and uh, you go out at the peak of the flight. Uh, you find that by uh, comparing with other sites in the area. So when uh, if other sites are approaching peak, then it's time for you to go and do your count. So how do you know if it's the peak? Well, you, you only know later, you, you, you can't tell. So you're going to do more than one peak count. If you really good at it, you'll get one before the peak, one at the peak and one after the peak. But uh, if you take one and there's lots of butterflies and then you take another one in good conditions and there's only half as many, well, you pass the peak. You don't need to do another one. You'll just take your uh, maximum highest count as, as the peak. So generally, there'd be lots of males at the peak. Well, depending on the capacity of the site, uh, there'd be fresh males, you know, males that look sharp because they've only just emerged. And there'll be females present as well, making up maybe a third, 40% of the population. That's, that's the normal, uh, that's what they, it consists of at the peak. So anyway, conduct up to three counts if you need them. So you just count butterflies. If you want to count both the males and the females, take two. Otherwise, I just use one of these things. And every time I see a blue male butterfly, I click. And uh, by the end of the site, I have my total. So you also need to catch them. You need to have the ratio of Fender's blue butterflies to silvery blue butterflies because uh, that ratio is going to adjust your total count. If you had a uh, hundred butterflies and uh, but only 80% were Fender's blues, then you'll have 80 butterflies. So you need to be very careful uh, measuring this ratio. And to do that, you have to go out and catch as many butterflies as you can from all over your sampling area and uh, clock which we have the number of fenders, the number of silveries, and then uh, derive the ratio. 
So your modified peak count, it depends on your skill at interpreting your area and finding the butterflies. So you're going to have important resources in the area, lupins especially. Uh, the butterflies, the females tend to stay close to the lupins and the males often stay close to the females. They may go elsewhere. They may, you know, this one, it's got mud. The males like mud, and they'll go and sit in it. And uh, the males will go further than the females for nectar. So you need to look at nectar patches. But in reality, uh, the nectar is likely to be all, all over the site. There's uh, probably going to be vetches and uh, maybe other uh, attractive plants throughout this area. So you're going to want to look very carefully at here. And you only go over it once because if you do more than that, you're going to be recounting the butterflies. Then if this is good for uh, nectar, you're going to want to look at this. You're going to want to look at the uh, mud and probably just go do some lines across this other area, assuming there are uh, flowers present, they usually are, and that's going to be your peak count. Uh, you don't go over any of these areas twice. Now, distance sampling is the biggie. This is the method for larger sites. And in distance sampling, you're going to create, make an estimate of the butterfly population of a sampling universe, the defined survey area. So in this case, you're not counting all the butterflies, you're just counting a sample, and uh, there'll be a distance program that will convert your sample into a population estimate for the whole area. And the area is uh, the area that includes your transects. So you've established your transects, and now you need to conduct your uh, sampling. You'll need to do them at least five and probably six times during the adult flight period. And you'll need to do it when temperature, wind and cloud cover are acceptable. And if it's got cloud cover and rain, uh, don't even go out there. You, know, you can't do a survey under those conditions. So if there's a period of bad weather, you know, this is going to mess up your sampling a whole lot. You may have a a couple of weeks in the middle when you can't actually get a good count and you need to be sitting waiting for the right conditions and as soon as the wind drops the sun comes out and the temperature goes up you need to be out there uh, getting your uh, getting your data hopefully that won't happen hopefully it'll be lovely weather all through the all through may so the yeah, butterfly counts, the protocols in the handbook and uh, videos uh, posted here, uh, the field videos showing you how to set up. And you're going to record your data probably on a, probably on your cell phone. It's probably the easiest way to do it. So, wind. What are you going to do about the wind? Uh, well, you're going to have to figure out um, how to measure wind speed. So this is two ways that it's measured. You could do MPH uh, or Beaufort scale. And uh, you can, you could get a, uh, something that'll measure the wind, a handheld anemometer that would be quite useful because it would tell you what the wind speed is without you having to guess, but zero, if the Beaufort scale has zero, uh, less than one MPH, uh, this is very good conditions for butterflies. And how do you tell? Well, the air is hardly moving. If you could see any smoke, then it would be going pretty much straight up. The leaves will be hardly moving at all. So zero, one, this is good. Uh, you can see the leaves moving. You can feel a slight breeze but the wind's less than three miles, and three miles an hour less, the butterflies will all be flying, uh, doing their normal uh, 
behavior for good flight conditions. So once you get here, once you get to two on the Beaufort scales, or somewhere of around four to seven, maybe five, six miles per hour, it's still okay. You're, as long as the other conditions, as long as it's nice and warm, uh, the butterflies will still be flying. But you know, around here in our part of the world, when the when it's two or two and a half or whatever, you it, it'll often gust to three. And three is no good. By the time it gets up around eight, nine, ten miles an hour, the butterflies don't like to fly. Some of them will, but they'll probably go down into the grass or maybe just uh, cling to the lupins and sit there. So you can't actually sense us because you know you're you might be able to see the butterfly, but uh, you're not able to get comparable data to the normal distance uh, sampling carried out under good conditions. So once it starts gusting up, you probably want to wait, see if it goes down again. If it doesn't, you just have to abandon your survey. Maybe come back the next day and continue it where you left it left off, something like that. And, uh, you know, this is, feels windy at this speed. Uh, the grasses are moving a lot. The, uh, you know that the wind, you, 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 can, you feel different facing into the wind. You can feel the wind behind your head when you're turned out of it. It's hard to use data sheets. So, you know, you, you, can, you can tell uh, when it's unsuitable. If it feels uncomfortable to you, then it certainly feels uncomfortable to the butterflies as well. So cloud cover and temperature. Temperature, very important. Below 60 degrees, the butterflies will stay in the grass. They will not fly. Uh, preferably, how do the sensors when the temperature's 65, say, nice, and that's sort of getting warm enough for the butterflies to all be behaving normally. Uh, don't go out there early in the morning. That's, uh, wait, wait till the day heats up a bit, and then your butterflies will be happily winging it around the meadow. Uh, cloud cover, yeah, you know, if it's high cloud cover, They'll, that won't really affect them, uh, you know, as long as it's warm enough and uh, the wind's not too strong. But, you know, if it's cool and uh, getting a bit windy and, uh, and there's also high cloud cover, you may find that the butterflies just say, uh, uh, not getting out of bed today, let's stay down in the grass. So you need to record these conditions. So, you know, if it stays pretty much the same for your whole census, just record them once. But uh, if you think they're changing, then uh, you know, note down that uh, the, the one or more of these has changed. You know, when uh, say when you maybe it was one set of conditions for one to five, six low temperature, sixty four, and then it was for the next it had got up to over seventy. So you might want to uh, change that. But if you think they're the say the same all the way through, you know, just got. One, you, you just copy it all the way down for all the observations in your uh, census. So you're going to move along your distance sampling transect. Uh, you need to walk at a steady pace and you mostly need to look ahead and don't look too far ahead. Sort of look into the middle distance, five meters ahead, something like that. That's where you keep your eyes more or less there. You can glance side to side. Uh, but don't spend a whole lot of time turning your head sideways to spot butterflies that are several meters away from the transect. If they're more than five meters away, it's not worth your while because they won't be included in the data. So you sort of need to match your speed to the most difficult terrain that you're going to encounter because, you know, if you've got a steep hill and uh, or a lot of some difficult vegetation, then, you know, you need to be going at a steady speed. So go with your uh, slowest speed. It's fine to stop. You can stop your data recording. Uh, you can stop because you need a rest or because you want to drink of water or because you actually want to catch a butterfly and I identify it. But remember that you've stopped and while you're stopped, you're not counting butterflies. And it's best if you don't even look 
ahead because you know you'll see butterflies and that's going to bias your sampling in future you'll know where they are already so what I do is if I stop and catch a butterfly and ID it, then I just turn around and face back the way I came to record my data, let the butterfly go, and then start to uh, turn around and keep, uh, keep moving. And you can only count butterflies that are ahead of you when you first spot them. So if a butterfly sort of comes racing up from behind and goes past you, uh, that doesn't count because you might already have counted it further back down the transect. So only butterflies that are ahead. So you see one and uh, maybe you have a measuring pole attached to your net or some way of measuring distance. Uh, this is very important. There are that your data goes into distance bins so that all the observations within 5.5 meter uh, perpendicular distance, that means at right angles to your transect. So everything between zero and 0 0.5 meters is going to be put in a bin for analysis. And it's going to be lumped with the bin, bin on the other side of you. So you're going to, you now have a, uh, a, a ribbon, a narrow transect that's one meter wide and the uh, transect is in the middle of it, and it's uh, half a meter each side. So any butterflies you see in there are going to go into this first bin, which you will record as zero. You're going to record the distance zero, and then the distance program knows that this is your one meter, one meter right around the transect, and it's expecting you to be very, very good, 100% capture, or uh, observation in that area. So probably you, the next bin is two separate pieces. It's 0 0.5 to one meters, one side, and 0 0.5 to one meters, the other side. So it's another one meter bin, but it's a bit further away. Probably uh, you'll be getting all the butterflies in that meter as well. So you've now, you know, with those two bins, you've got, uh, one meter each side of you. What, you. what happens beyond that is that your ability to see all the butterflies decreases. And uh, the further away you are, the less percentage of the butterflies there will be recorded. And uh, were you to you know, put your data together and make a graph of this, you'd see very clearly that your uh, perception is, uh, your, ability to see the uh, butterflies is tailing off with distance and uh, the program will fit that to you you'll have your own uh, way of decay, decay of uh, uh, visibility so uh, the program will calculate that and then figure out how many butterflies were there uh, given the fact that you know whatever three meters you were only actually spotting 50% of them. Anyway, that's a bit complicated, but the bottom line here is that you need to be very careful getting your butterflies into these bins. Was it one meter away from you? Was it 1.5 meters? Was it two meters when you first saw it? So there you are. And then what else do you need to record? Is it a male or is it a female? So if it's a male, it's probably going to be a male fenders or a male silvery. But it doesn't matter. You just record it as a male. And the females are going to be brown or coppery. If you, you don't actually have to record the females because the program only deals with males. But it's very good information. Uh, particularly if you've got a lot of females, it'll tell you, you know, what stage you're at in the flight. Uh, you can mistake uh, males for females. The uh, males, old ones, later in the season will shed a lot of their blue scales and at a distance they may resemble the females. So you need to be careful as to, you know, is it actually a, a 
female or is it uh, sort of male that's uh, uh, shed its lot of its scales? If, if it is, it'll still have some blue on it, but it won't be the nice bright shiny blue of the freshly emerged males. So male, and uh, you need to say male or female. Which one was it? Is it a cluster? You need to record this. If it's a, uh, if you didn't see more than one butterfly, you need to put one in the cluster column. So it has to have a male or female in the male or female cost. Uh, it's all you've already got your distance, sex. Uh, how many of them were together? So a cluster is butterflies that you see at the same point. So you're looking over there and there's uh, two males and a female all clustered around the top of a uh, lupin. That's three. And you write three for the cluster and then you put all the, you put a, a letter for each one. So you put in the male, female, you put MMF or something like that. So you'd put one letter for each number in your cluster. So if the, your cluster was one, which most of them will be, it's either an M or an F. But if it's two, then you could have MM, FF, or FM. So be sure to complete this uh, correctly and make sure that you're you know, aware of this and gathering the data uh, as you see the butterflies, because you know, if you have to wait and think about it later, you may well have forgotten what's going on. So if you see, saw one, you've seen a male and it's, uh, you know, you've got its distance, it was at two meters, it flies towards the line, it's now at one meter and it stirs up another butterfly. Uh, if it does that, you don't have a cluster, you have two individuals. So the first one has its distance, whatever it was, two meters, one male flying, and the second one is just one male flying at one meter. And yeah, that's the last thing you're going to need to record. Was it sitting or was it flying? Almost always flying. And if it was sitting, but you didn't notice it till it was flying, then that counts as flying. It's uh, very rare that you actually see one sitting, but uh, if you do, it's quite likely to be a female. So you've done that. You've been along your survey. You've done all your transects. You now need this very important piece of information. You need the uh, male FBB to male silvery blue butterfly ratio. And uh, later in the season, the silveries tend to disappear. So you're quite likely to end up with 100% fenders, but particularly early and probably around the fenders peak, there are going to be silveries present and you need to subtract them from your total number. And you do that by calculating the percent of uh, fenders. So what are you going to do? Well, what I do is I just catch them as I go along my transects and that way they're spread all across my sampling area. Uh, if you do them before or afterwards, then you need to take them not just from one part of your sur survey area, because you may have butterflies emerging at different times across a hill or something like that. So you need to collect them from uh, across the whole area that you're sampling. And how many do you want? Well, the manual says 10, but I don't think that's enough. Maybe 10, you know, if it's a end of the flight or the beginning of the flight, maybe 10 is all there is. But, you know, if, it, you're, if it's a fairly large population and it's at the peak, then you really need more than that uh, because you could easily get sampling error. You could just randomly get two fenders and eight silveries when the actual ratio is five to five. So, you know, the smaller the number that you collect, the more chance there is you're going to be way off in your estimate. And this is very important when your population is peaking and there's a lot of butterflies present. So what I try to do is get 20 or even more than 20. And that's going to give you a better, better ratio. 
And that's the end of that video. So I'm going to end.